A few weeks ago, while on sale, I decided to buy Celeste, a simple story platformer game, and I've since put about 30 hours into it. In that time, I've not only managed to complete the game, but obtain every achievement for it. Every achievement except for one. The only thing left for me to do is to collect the Moonberry, a trophy hidden in a secret part of the last level. Why don't I have it? The simple answer is that it's hard. Really hard. In fact, only 5.7% of people who have played the game have ever grabbed it. I'm sure if I really set my mind to it, I could get it within a couple of hours, but I know it would take time. I would try over and over and inevitably fail. Eventually though, I would succeed. So what's really stopping me from collecting this Moonberry? Maybe it's the fear that even after I put in all these hours, I still won't be able to do it. Maybe all that failure will make me so angry that I'll turn the game off and never play it again. This is a common theme throughout Celeste, a game where you are given the impossible task of climbing a mountain with nothing but your own determination. It's you versus the world. Every level of the game gets harder and harder, sometimes seemingly impossible, but with enough effort you'll always pull through and climb higher. Even once you conquer the mountain, you still have remixed B-sides and C-sides you can play to prove yourself once again. At the heart of it, that's what Celeste is all about, pushing yourself more and more to achieve a monumental task, one step at a time. But what happens if the fear of failure prevents you from pushing onward? What happens when the threat of a challenge is too strong? After all, how can you climb a mountain when you aren't willing to take the first step? Spoiler warning, if you want to experience the game's story for yourself, you should probably click off this video. In Celeste, you play as Madeline, a girl who, in an attempt to escape the depression and anxiety of her life, tries to climb Celeste Mountain to prove to herself that she is capable. Pretty early on, you meet two characters who turn out to be pretty important. Granny, a seemingly eccentric woman living on the mountain, and Theo, another climber. After progressing forward a little bit more in what the game refers to as Chapter 2, Madeline finds herself in front of a mirror where an evil purple version of herself breaks free and escapes. This mirror version of Madeline, who refers to herself as part of Madeline, represents all of her fears and worries. She tells herself that it's too much, that she can't handle the mountain. And when she confronts Madeline, when these fears are shown to Madeline, she runs away. In a way, that's the same reason Madeline came to the mountain, by running from her old life. Of course, you can't always run from your problems. Eventually they'll catch up and you need to deal with them. This is true for Madeline because although she escapes that part of her, it isn't the last time she ends up seeing it. This part of me character doesn't only exist for Madeline though. We all have one. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean an evil purple version of me exists who can fly, but rather a metaphorical version. Even the game expresses this by saying that once Madeline leaves Celeste Mountain, this part of her loses its body and just goes back to being, well, her. We all have this part of us that prevents us from doing the things we want to do, whether climbing a mountain or not, because of the fear that we'll fail. We could hurt ourselves or embarrass ourselves or even just waste our time. Sometimes this fear can be controlling and just cause us to break down if we can't escape it, and Celeste actually gives a great representation of it. This is of course with the main character of Chapter 3, Mr. Oshiro, the manager and ghost of a failed hotel. Really, his only goal is to convince Madeline to want to spend the night in an attempt to prove to himself that he and his hotel aren't failures. However, Madeline, wanting to climb the mountain, has no intention of staying at the hotel and actually expresses this multiple times. Of course, Mr. Oshiro chooses to ignore Madeline and throughout the chapter becomes more and more unhinged as it becomes clear she won't be staying. Mr. Oshiro's fear that he won't be able to convince Madeline to stay continues to grow until the part of her from earlier shows up and pushes him over the edge. Personally, I think the monster he turns into could actually represent the same part of himself that Madeline struggles with and, of course, not knowing how to deal with the situation, Madeline runs away again. I think that not only does this whole chapter show how easily fear allows us to bring each other down, but also gives an example of what would happen if we let it consume us. 
The next chapter of the game, Chapter 4, is largely insignificant if not for its ending. While riding a gondola with Theo, Madeline has a panic attack as it breaks down. Of course, the breakdown is caused by the part of Madeline who hides just out of sight. This episode of Madeline struggling with her fears is different though, simply because this time she can't run. To help her deal with this, Theo teaches Madeline a breathing exercise that represents a pretty significant shift in Madeline's attitude towards fear. For the first time, we can see it Rather than run away, Madeline is actually fighting back as represented by the feather from this exercise. Fighting back against her fears of failing is going to become her new strategy for coping, and chapter 5 does something really interesting with this. The chapter is set in this temple that's supposed to manifest on fears, and there's one screen in particular that really shows Madeline's new perspective. After finding and getting sucked into a broken mirror, you actually stop playing as Madeline and take control of this floating eye monster thing. These guys show up all around the level and are supposed to be another manifestation of Madeline's fears. But again, the interesting part of that screen is how you control the monster. I think that this ties back to the idea of facing fears because in order for Madeline to continue, she needs to let herself be hit by the monster. She's once again put into a situation where she can't run, but instead must face her fears. This is followed by another conversation with the other part of Madeline, but rather than run away, she becomes more determined. And after continuing to face these monsters, the chapter ends with the saving of Theo and escape from the temple. This directly leads into the start of the next chapter featuring a conversation between Theo and Madeline about their lives and their fears. Later in the night, Madeline wakes up to have a conversation with herself, emphasizing her new ideology on directly battling her fears. Madeline goes into this conversation with the goal of leaving behind this other part of herself. Again, this is different than previous encounters because Madeline, the main Madeline, is in charge now. Well, she's in charge until she isn't. Once again, her fears begin to take control, and using her new strategy, she tries to fight back. However, she can't succeed, and her symbolic feather is destroyed. Her fears take over, and she falls to the bottom of the mountain. Not being able to run away from her fears, and not being able to fight them, Madeline gives up. On her way out of the mountain, she once more runs into Granny, and when explaining why she's giving up, Granny states that a glimpse of truth is good for people, even if you can't accept what you see. There's no shame in running back to your car and driving away. Someday you'll be ready to come back. You can run from your fear, and you can ignore it, but you won't succeed until you accept it. Speaking to her again, we'll have her explaining why she lives on the mountain in the first place, saying that it and the things it creates are places of healing. She also says that the first step of healing is confronting the problem. This conversation represents another change in the ideology of Madeline, where instead of running or hiding from her fears, she's beginning to embrace them. She begins to understand that this part of her really is part of her and can't be destroyed or abandoned, and the only way to move forward is to make peace with herself. With her new sense of determination, Madeline's first step is to find this part of her and convince it to work with her. The part that follows is possibly my favorite in the entire game, where you're battling this part of yourself, trying to convince her to help you. And eventually, after some convincing, Madeline finally manages to make peace with herself, making her stronger than ever before. Now, being empowered, the two halves of Madeline zoom through the full game together and finally reach the peak. At the top of the mountain, the other part of Madeline asks, what's gonna happen next? After spending the entirety of the game running from her fears or trying to ignore them, worrying about her future and despairing her failures, Madeline, finally at peace, decides not to worry about it, and decides to just enjoy the moment to see how far she's come. On her way down the mountain, Madeline learns she isn't the only one to make peace with herself, as she sees Mr. Oshiro finally outside of his hotel. The story isn't completely over, however. There is one more chapter of importance. Chapter 9 takes place sometime after Madeline has finished climbing the mountain. After the death of Granny, Madeline has fallen apart, succumbing to these old fears of hers. Returning to Celeste Mountain, she begins to follow Granny's bird, believing it to have some sort of significance. Determined that the bird is related to Granny, so much so that she refuses to listen to the other part of herself, she finds herself weaker in a way similar to she was at the start of the game. She is once again trying to ignore her fears without embracing them. 
Later in the level, she finds its heart, which typically represents the end of a level, but Madeline won't accept that this is the end. Her fears have shifted from her inability to climb the mountain to her inability to save Granny, putting her in denial and ignoring the other part of her. She can't understand why both the part of her and the bird won't help her, and blame them for not wanting to save Granny. She refuses to let go of her. Eventually, after Madeline realizes she's actually hurting the bird, the last part of Granny, her other part of her is able to get through to her and convince her she needs to let go. With one final change of heart, Madeline, the other part of her, and the bird are all able to escape, but not without one last conversation with Granny. Climbing the mountain taught Madeline that anything is possible if only she embraced her fears. But this last chapter taught her how to let go. It taught her that the embracing of her fears means understanding the rationale behind them and to really understand what she was getting into. Once she did this, she understood what her real goal should be and rather than chase something that isn't meant to be caught, she needs to let go. Maybe after all this, I gain a new appreciation for the moonberry I still need to grab. Maybe I'll understand if pursuing it is the right idea, and I'll know how to embrace my fears, how to embrace this part of me in order to do so. Or maybe the best way to make peace is to understand that it isn't meant to be, and I'll decide to let go. After all, only I can make peace with myself when it comes to the moonberry. Of course, this isn't really about moonberries, is it? Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like and consider subscribing. It would mean a lot to me. See you later.